Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course on mail, FTP, and proxy settings. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to look at our requirements from our CompTIA a 22702, section 3.1. And we're going to learn about configuring mail protocol settings like SMTP, IMAP, and POP. We're going to configure FTP settings, and we're going to look to see how to configure some of the proxy settings that are in the browser running on our systems. On large enterprise networks or even home networks, you can run into situations where programs need a very specific set of configuration pr parameters for them to work properly, and none more so than some of the mail settings you'll run into. What I did was put up three of the different mail settings that I have in some of my email programs. This is for SMTP, this one's for POP, and this one is for IMAP. So different mail programs work in different ways. And even the same mail program, like this one, can actually communicate to a single mail server in different ways using different protocols. Now, if you aren't sure which one of these to use on your configuration, you may want to talk to the administrator for your mail and find out how this works. But let's step through each one of these. SMTP is used to be able to at least send traffic out from your computer to somewhere else. So if you don't have an SMTP server defined, it's not going to be able to send any mail messages. You may be able to receive messages because those use POP and IMAP, but you are not going to be able to send any mail out. SMTP is also used on the internet between mail servers. We're not really configuring those. We are really wanting to configure the SMTP settings for our machines. It's not really that hard. You simply give it a description usually. The thing that you must have is the name of the SMTP server that you'll be connecting to that will be your mail relay out. And there'll be a port number. Usually the default is 25 that you use to communicate to that SMTP server. Almost all SMTP servers these days also require that you put a username and a password in. And that's because if an open mail server was there, anybody could use that mail server to send out mail. And in these days, because there's so much spam and trouble over the mail, you really want to tighten down exactly who's sending all of that mail out. So this authentication is almost always used. Sometimes you're using secure authentication. Sometimes you're not. So you have to ask the person who manages that SMTP server exactly what you should put into that view. If you're using an ISP's SMTP server, they'll give you a list of the configurations that you should have in there. Once that's put in, you should be able at that point to send mail to whoever you'd like to on the internet. To be able to grab mail from your mail server and look at it, to be able to read the incoming mail to you, you either have to have a POP mail server or an IMAP mail server. A POP mail server means that the mail is stored temporarily out on your ISP server. And what this POP mail server does is it goes out to that POP server and it grabs the mail and it transfers all of the mail down to your computer. At that point, that mail is no longer on the ISP server all of your mail is now local on your machine. So it becomes important that you back that up. If you lose your machine, the hard drive goes bad, something happens to your laptop, you're not going to have access to your mail any longer. You have to know where that mail server is. You'll get a server name for the mail server. The default port number is 995. And then you have to put in your username. And it also, once it begins its first check, will prompt you for the password. And that's going to log you into the POP server. And it's going to check your credentials and send you down the mail specific to you. If you want to be sure that nobody can read your mail while it's being transferred down to you, you may want to be sure that you can use some of these connection security protocols like SSL, which also another name for that is TLS, to be able to transfer the mail, but have all of that mail encrypted as it's coming down for you. Almost all POP servers and IMAP servers these days that do any type of mail to any degree are usually doing some type of encryption as well. You've got other options in here, but those are really specific to the mail clients you're using to go out and automatically grab that information and see what's there. Another type of mail server is the IMAP mail server. There are a lot of additional capabilities on an IMAP server to be able to set up folders, to be able to mark things as read, because all of your mail is also kept out there on the server itself. An IMAP server is a bit more complex than a POP server. Not everybody has access to an IMAP server. But if you have access to one, make sure you use that rather than the POP mail server. There's just a lot more functionality there for you. 
Like the pop mail server, you will need a server name, a port number, and a username to log into this as. So this becomes important whenever you start working with mail servers that you have all of these different parameters, whether you're sending mail with SMTP or being able to read your mail through a pop server or an IMAP server. If you're transferring mail to an FTP server, then you probably already use an FTP client on your workstation. I use FileZilla, for instance, and these are the configuration parameters you can put in FileZilla. At a very bare minimum, you're going to need an IP address or name of the host that you'll be connecting to, that's your FTP server, and you'll also need a port number that's used to use that FTP protocol. You're also going to need a login name and a password. If this is an open FTP server or it's one that doesn't require authentication, then you use a special username and password called anonymous. This is just a standard name that every FTP server uses. So you put in anonymous and usually you can put in really anything in the password prompt. Usually people will put in their email address there so that it's in the log and people can tell that it's you logging into the FTP server, but you don't have to do that. Once you have those parameters in there, you should be able to connect to an FTP server. And at that point, your client allows you to transfer files up, transfer files down. You can uh, create folders or transfer folders over. Anything else that you may need to do is all based on these parameters that you added into that FTP server setting. Many large environments use proxies to communicate over the internet. Very simply put, proxies are used as a central clearinghouse. Every device in your network talks to the proxy, and then the proxy out on the internet does the communication out to the internet servers. It's a bit of a go-between, and in some ways it provides you with some additional security features. Well, to be able to use the proxy though, your applications have to be proxy aware. They have to know how to operate in that environment because most of the time our browsers are going directly out to Google and back again. So you're, you have to have a specially programmed application that understands how to work with a proxy for it to be able to work properly. It's one of the disadvantages of proxies is that the application has to be proxy aware to be able to use it. If you pop open your browser and look at the configuration settings for the proxy, you can see that you have no proxy settings. You turn that on and you don't even use Use a proxy. You can auto detect proxy settings for the network. Many large environments set their systems up to automatically know how to use the proxy. And you can put in manual proxy configurations as well, which means you would put in your local IP address of whatever proxy you'd like to use and the port number that's being used to that proxy. These are, char these are characteristics and values that you're going to need to get from your network administrator. They're going to know exactly what you'll use for that HTTP proxy. Sometimes that same proxy information is used to do SSL, to do FTP, and other protocols as well. But if that's not the case, then you'll need the proxy IP address for SSL and the port number that's being used, and the proxy IP address for FTP and the port number that's being used. You can also specify that certain IP addresses will not ever go to the proxy. And for instance, the local host or your loopback address is a really good example of that. In those particular cases, there may be devices that you don't want to go through the proxy to access. You want to talk directly to those devices, and you'd add them right in here into these exceptions for the proxies. Let's review some of these things we've learned about mail, FTP, and proxy settings. Which mail communications protocol is commonly used by a client to send mail? Well, if you recall, we saw the initial configuration of that SMTP server, and that stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. The next question is, which FTP username is commonly used as a default login? We saw that for FTP. If you're not logging in with the username and password, you're probably using the anonymous logon. And the last question, what is a significant configuration consideration for a workstation when you're using proxies? Well, there's a few of them. One of the most significant is that every application must be configured to use the proxy, or you're not going to be able to talk out to the internet. That covers our requirements for our mail, FTP, and proxy settings. We've gone through SMTP, IMAP, POP, our FTP, and our proxy settings in this module. If you'd like to see any of our absolutely free a videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards or much more, you can visit our website at freeaplus.com. <laughs>